Section 40 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a Library Vox recording. All Library Vox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibraryVox.org. Recording by Timothy Nielsen. www.MrTimmy.com. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. Ole Lukage, the Dustman. There is nobody in all the world who can tell so many stories as Ole Lukage, and such stories as he can tell. When night is drawing on, and the children are sitting round the table as good as possible, or on their little footstools, in walks Ole Shut Eyes. He comes so quietly up the stairs without his shoes, and opens the door so softly that nobody hears him, and puff! He sends a shower of milk into their eyes in such fine spray as to be invisible. But they can't keep their eyes open after it, and so they never see him. He steals behind them and breathes upon their necks, making their heads as heavy as lead. But he never hurts them. He does it all from kindness to the children. He only wants them to be quiet, and the best way to make them quiet is to have them in bed. When they are settled there, he can tell them his stories. Then, as soon as the children are asleep, Ole Lukage seats himself upon their beds. He is well dressed. His clothes are of silk, but it is impossible to say what color they are for it shimmers green, red, and blue every time he turns. He has an umbrella under his arm, one with pictures on it, and this he holds over the good children, and then they dream the most delightful stories all night long. The other umbrella has no pictures on it, and he holds this one over the children who have been naughty, and then they sleep heavily until the morning, and have no dreams at all. I am now going to tell you about a little boy to whom Ole Lukage went every night for a whole week. His name was Halmar. There are just seven stories, because there are seven days in a week. Monday Now just listen, said Ole Lukage in the evening, when he had got Halmar to bed. First I will smarten things up a bit. And then all the plants in the pots became big trees, their branches stretching right up to the ceiling and along the walls, so that the room looked like a delightful arbor. The branches were covered with flowers, and the flowers were more beautiful than the roses. They had the most delightful scent, and if you tried to eat them, were more delicious than the very nicest jam. The fruit shone like gold, and then there were the buns bursting with the plums. They were splendid. All at once the most miserable grumbles came from the table drawer where Hallmore school books were kept. What is that now? said Ole Lukage, going along and opening the drawer. It was the slate groaning and writhing because there was a wrong figure in the sum set on it, and it was ready to fall to pieces. The pencil was hopping and skipping at the end of its piece of string, just as if it had been a little dog which would like to try and do the sum, but it couldn't. Then there was Hallmore's copying book clamoring away inside its covers most pitifully, there was a roll of capital letters down each side of every leaf, each with a little one beside it. Then beside them letters which imagined they looked like them, but these were written by Hallmar. They looked almost as if they had tumbled over the line on which they had ought to be standing upright. See, this is how you ought to hold yourselves, said the headlines. So, to one side with brisk flourish. Oh, we should like nothing better, said Homer's letters, but we can't. We are so crooked. 
then you shall have a dose of medicine, said Ole Lukic. Oh no, they cried, and then they stood up as stiffly as possible. Well, now we can't tell any stories, said Ole Lukic. I must drill them. One, two, one, two. And then he drilled the letters, and they stood up stiffer than any headlines could stand. But when Ole Lukic went away, and Talmar woke up in the morning, they were as crooked as ever. Tuesday As soon as Hallmar was in bed, Ole Lukic touched all the furniture in the room with his little wooden wand, and everything began to talk. They all talked about themselves, except the spittoon, which was silent and much annoyed that they were all so vain as only to talk about themselves, and to pay no attention to him, standing so modestly in the corner, and allowing himself to be spat upon. There was a big picture in the gilt frame hanging over a chest of drawers. It was a landscape in which one saw tall old trees, flowers growing in the grass, and a great piece of water, with a river flowing from it round behind a wood, past many castles and away to the open sea. Ole Lukic touched the picture with his wand, and the birds in it began to sing. The branches of the trees moved, and the clouds scuttled along, and you could see their shadows passing over the landscape. Now Ole Lukic lifted little Hamar up close to the frame, and Hamar put his leg right into the picture among the long grass, and there he stood. The sun shone down upon him through the branches of the trees. He ran to the water and got into a little boat which lay there. It was painted red and white, and the sails shone like silver. Six swans, all with golden crowns round their necks, and a shining blue star upon their heads, drew the boat past the dark green woods where the trees told stories about robbers and witches, and the flowers told other stories about the pretty little elves, and all that the butterflies had told them. Beautiful fish with gold and silver scales swam after the boat. Every now and then they sprang out of the water and back again with a splash. Red and blue birds, large and small, flew in two lines behind them. The gnats buzzed, and the cockchafers boomed. They all wanted to go with Hallmar, and each of them had a story to tell. That was a sailing trip indeed. Now the woods were thick and dark. Now they were like beautiful gardens full of sunshine and flowers. Among them were castles of glass and marble. Princesses stood upon the balconies, and they were all the little girls whom Hallmar knew and used to play with. They stretched out their hands, each one holding the most beautiful sugar pig which any cake woman could sell. Hallmar took a hold of one end of the pig as they sailed by, and the princess held tight to the other, and each had a share she the smaller and Hamar the bigger. Little princes stood sentry by each castle. They saluted with golden swords and showered down sugar plums and tin soldiers. They were princes indeed. Now he sailed through a wood, now through great halls, or right through a town. He passed through the one where his nurse lived, she who used to carry him about when he was quite a little boy, and who was so fond of him. She nodded and waved her hand to him, and sang a pretty little song which she had written herself and sent to Hallmar. I dream of thee for many an hour, Hallmar my own, my sweeting. My kisses once fell like a shower, thy brow and red cheeks greeting. My near thy first formed word addressed, thy last must be in parting. May you on earth by heaven be blessed, 
angel from heavenward darting. All the birds sang too, the flowers danced upon their stalks, and the old trees nodded, just as if Ole Lukage were telling them stories. Wednesday How the rain was pouring down outside. Hallmark could even hear it in his sleep, and when Ole Lukage opened the window, the water stood right up to the sill. It was a regular lake, and a beautiful ship lay close to the house. Will you sail with me, little Hallmark? said Ole Lukage. If you will, you can go to the distant countries tonight, and be back here again in the morning. Then all at once, Hallmar found himself in his best Sunday clothes on board a beautiful ship. It was heavenly weather, and they sailed through the streets, past the church, till they reached a wild open sea. They sailed so far that there was no more land to be seen. They saw a flock of storks leaving home on their way to warmer countries, flying in a line, one behind the other. They had already flown a long, long way. One of them was so tired that his wings could hardly carry him any further. He was the last one in the row, and soon he was a long way behind. At last he sank, with outspread wings, lower and lower. He flapped his wings feebly for a few strokes, but it was no use. Now he touched the rigging of the ship with his feet, and slid down the sail with a flop onto the deck. Then the cabin boy picked him up and put him into the hen house, with the chickens, the ducks, and the turkeys. The poor stork stood among them looking quite depressed. What a creature! said all the hens. The turkey cock puffed himself up as big as he could, and asked who he was, and the ducks waddled backwards, pushing against each other, saying, Quack, quack! <laughs> then the stork told them about the sunny Africa, and the pyramids, and the ostrich running across the deserts like a wild horse. But the ducks did not understand him, and they pushed each other and said, are we agreed he is an idiot? Mm, yes, idiot he is indeed, said the turkey cock with a gobble. Then the stork became quite silent, thought about his beloved Africa. Nice thin legs you've got there, said the turkey cock. How much a yard? Quack, 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 grinned all the ducks. But the stork appeared not to hear them. You're quite at liberty to laugh, too, said the turkey cock to him. It was a very witty remark, or perhaps it was too low for you. Gobble, gobble. He's not many-sided, he said to the others. It's good enough to amuse us. Gobble, gobble. Then all the hens clucked and the ducks quacked. It was tremendous amusement they got out of it. But Hallmar went along to the hen house, opened the door, and called the stork and it hopped out onto the deck to him. It was rested now, and it seemed to nod to Hallmar to thank him. Thereupon it spread its wings and flew away to the warm countries. But the hens clucked, the ducks quacked, and the turkey cock's head got as red as fire. Tomorrow we'll make you into soup, said Hallmar. Then he woke up and found himself lying in his own little bed. That was an extraordinary journey old Lukage had taken him. Thursday I'll tell you what, said Ole Lukage. Don't be frightened, and I will show you a little mouse. And he stretched out his hand with the tiny little animal in it. It has come to invite you to a wedding. There are two little mice who intend to enter a wedded state tonight. They live under the floor of your mother's larder, which they say is the most delightful residence. But how can I get through a little mouse hole in the floor? said Hallmar. Leave that to me, 
said Ole Lukage. I'll soon make you small enough. Then he touched Hallmar with his wand, and he quickly grew smaller and smaller. At last he was not as tall as one's finger. Now, you may borrow a tin soldier's clothes. I think they'll just fit you, and it looks so smart to have on a uniform when one's in company. Yes, indeed, said Hallmar, and in a moment he was dressed like the grandest tin soldier. Be so good as to take a seat in your mother's thimble, said the little mouse, and I shall have the honor of drawing you. Heavens, are you going to take that trouble yourself? young lady, said Hallmar, and off they drove to the mouse's wedding. First they went down under the floor into a long passage, which was just high enough for them to drive through, and the whole passage was lighted up with the touchwood. Isn't there a delicious smell here? said the mouse, who was drawing him. The whole passage has been smeared over with bacon fat. Nothing could be nicer. Then they came to the bridal hall, where all the little lady mice stood on the right whispering and giggling, as if they were making fun of each other, and on the left stood all the gentlemen mice, stroking their whiskers with their paws. The bridal pair stood in the middle of the room, in a hollow rind of cheese, kissing each other most energetically before all of the people. But then they were engaged, you know, and just about to be married. More and more visitors poured in. The mice were almost crushing each other to death, and the bridal pair had taken their place in the doorway, so that one could neither get in nor out. The whole room, like the passage, was smeared with bacon fat. There were no other refreshments, but for dessert a pea was produced in which one of the little mice of the family had bitten the name of the bridal pair, that is to say, the first letter of it, and this was something quite extraordinary. All the mice said it was a delightful wedding, and the conversation was most entertaining. And then Hallmar drove home again. He had been in very grand company, but in order to get there he had been obliged to shrink wonderfully, to make himself small enough to get into the uniform of a tin soldier. Friday It is astounding what a number of grown-up people would like to get a hold of me, said Ole Lukage, especially those with a bad conscience. Good little Ole, they say to me, we can't close our eyes, and there we lie all night with all our bad deeds, staring us in the face. They are like naughty elfins. They come and sit on our beds and squirt hot water over us. Won't you come and chase them away, so that we may have a good sleep? And then they sigh deeply. We will gladly pay you, Ole. Good night. You will find the money on the window sill. But I don't do it for money, said Ole Lukage. What are we going to do tonight? asked Hallmar. Well, I don't know whether you would like to go to a wedding again tonight. It's a different kind from yesterday's. Your sister's big doll, the one that looks like a man, and is called Herman, he is to be married to Bertha. Besides which, it is her birthday, so there will be no end of presents. Oh, I know all about that. Whenever the dolls want new clothes, my sister lets them have a birthday or a wedding. It has happened hundreds of times. Yes, but tonight it is the hundred and first wedding, and the hundred and first is the end of all things. So that's why this one will be so grand. Just look. Hamar looked along at the table. There was a little pasteboard house with lights in the windows, and all the tin soldiers presenting arms outside. 
the bridal pair sat upon the floor leaning against the leg of the table. They were very thoughtful, and they had reason to be. Ole Lukage, dressed in a grandmother's black skirt, married them. When the ceremony was over, all the furniture in the room joined in singing the following pretty song, which had been written by pencil, and went to the tune of the tattoo. Our song shall swing like the wind, like the wind, till the bridal pair are enshrined, are enshrined. And they curtsied both like a stick, do you mind? For their wood inside with kid for a rind. Hurrah, hurrah, wood and skin well combined. We'll sing it out loud to the rain and the wind. Then the presents were given. But they had declined any edibles. Love was enough for them without anything else. Shall we go into the country or travel abroad? asked the bridegroom. And then they consulted the swallow, which had traveled so much, and the old mother hen, which had reared five broods of chickens. The swallow told them all about the delightful warm countries where the grapes hung in luscious clusters, and where the air was so mild, and the colors on the mountains were such as were not to be found elsewhere. But they haven't got our green cabbage, said the hen. I was in the country all one summer with my chicks. There was a gravel pit that we scratched in all day, and then we got a mission to a garden where the cabbage grew. Oh, how green it was! I can't imagine anything more beautiful. But one cabbage is just like another said the swallow, and then there's so much bad weather here. Oh, we're used to that, said the hen. But it's so cold, it freezes. That's good for the cabbage, said the hen. Besides, sometimes it is warm enough. Four years ago didn't we have a summer with tremendous heat? For five weeks one could hardly breathe. And then we don't have all the poisonous creatures they have abroad, and there are no robbers. Anyone who doesn't think our own country the best must be a fool. He doesn't deserve to live here. And then the hen began to cry. I've had my journeys too. I once traveled twelve miles in a barrel, and there's no pleasure in traveling. <sighs> ah. The hen is a wise woman, said Bertha the doll. I don't like traveling among mountains either, for first you go up and then you go down. No, we will move out by the gravel pit and take our walks in the cabbage garden. And that was the end of it. Saturday Are we going to have some stories? asked little Hallmar as soon as Ole Lukage had got him to bed. We haven't time for any tonight, said Ole, as he opened his prettiest umbrella. Just look at these Chinese. The whole umbrella looked exactly like a big Chinese bowl, with blue trees all over it, and arched bridges on which stood little people nodding their heads. We must have the whole world polished up for tomorrow, said Ole. It is a holiday, for it is Sunday. I must go up into the church tower to see if the little church brownies are polishing the bells so that they may sound well. I must go into the fields to see if the wind has blown the dust off the grass and leaves. My biggest piece of work is to get down all the stars to polish them. I take them in my apron, but first I have to number each one and the holes they belong have to be numbered too, so that they may go back into their proper places, or they wouldn't stick, and then we should be having too many falling stars. One after the other would drop out. Now I say, Mr. Lukage, said one of the old portraits hanging on the wall, I am Homer's great-grandfather. I am much obliged to you for telling him stories. 
but you mustn't puzzle his brains. The stars can't be taken down to be polished. The stars are planets just like our Earth, and that's the best of them. Much obliged to you, old great-grandfather, said Ole Lukic. My best thanks to you. You are the head of the family. You are an antiquity, but I am older than you. I'm an old heathen. The Greeks and the Romans call me Dream God. I have my footing in the grandest houses. I can get on both with big and little. You may tell the stories yourself. And then Ole Lukic went away and took his umbrella with him. I suppose one mayn't give an opinion now, said the old portrait, and then Hallmar woke. Sunday Good evening, said Ole Lukic, and Hallmar nodded, and then he jumped up and turned great-grandfather's portrait with its face to the wall, so that it should not talk as it did last time. Now you must tell me some stories about the five green peas which lived in the peas pod, and about the cock paying his addresses to the hen, and about the darning needle, which was so fine that it fancied it was an ordinary needle. You may have too much of a good time, said Ole Lukic. I would rather show you something you know. I will show you my brother. He is also called Ole Lukic but he never comes more than once to anybody. And when he comes, he takes them away with him on his horse and tells them stories. He only knows two, one which is so beautiful that nobody on earth can imagine it, and one which is too terrible to be described. And then Ole lifted little Hamar up to the window and said, Now you can see my brother the other Ole Lukic. He is also called Death. You see, he doesn't look at all bad, as he sometimes does in pictures, all bones and joints. No, he has silver embroidered border around his coat. It is a hussar's uniform, and a black velvet cloak streams out behind over his horseback. See how they are galloping? And Hallmar saw how Ole Lukic rode off, taking both old and young with him on his horse. He put some of them before him and some behind, but he always asked first, What character have you in your mark book? They all said, Good. Let me see myself, said he, and then they had to show him the book. All those who had been very good, or excellent, against their names were put up in the front of him, and were told the most delightful stories. But those who had only pretty good, or tolerable, had to sit behind him, and were told horrible stories. They shivered, and cried, and tried to get off the horse, but they couldn't do that, because they grew fast to it at once. But death is a beautiful Ole Lukic, said Homar. I am not a bit afraid of him. Nor need you be, said Ole Lukic, if only you take care to have a good character in your book. Ah, now that's instructive, mumbled great-grandfather's portrait. It's some good, after all, to speak one's mind and he was quite pleased. Now this is the story about Ole Lukic. Tonight he can tell you some more himself. End of section 40 Recording by Timothy Nielsen www.mrtimay.com Section 41 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, 
or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Furlong. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. Translated by Miss Edgar Lucas. The Swine Herd. There was once a poor prince. He had only quite a tiny kingdom, but it was big enough to allow him to marry, and he was bent upon marrying. Now it certainly was rather bold of him to say to the emperor's daughter, Will you have me? He did, however, venture to say so, for his name was known far and wide, and there were hundreds of princesses who would have said, Yes, and thank you kindly, but see if she would. Just let us hear about it. A rose tree grew on the grave of the prince's father. It was such a beautiful rose tree. It only bloomed every fifth year, and then only bore one blossom. But what a rose that was! By merely smelling it, one forgot all one's cares and sorrows. Then he had a nightingale, which sang as if every lovely melody in the world dwelt in her little throat. This rose and this nightingale were to be given to the princess, so they were put into great silver caskets and sent to her. The emperor had them carried before him into the great hall where the princess was playing at, visiting with her ladies-in-waiting. They had nothing else to do. When she saw the caskets with the gifts, she clasped her hands with delight. "'If only it were a little pussycat,' said she. But there was the lovely rose. "'Oh, how exquisitely it is made!' said all the ladies-in-waiting. "'It is more than beautiful.' said the emperor it is neat but the princess touched it and then she was ready to cry fie papa she said it is not made it is a real one fie said all the ladies in waiting it is a real one well let us see what there is in the other casket before we get angry said the emperor and out came the nightingale it sang so beautifully that at first no one could find anything to say against it superb charmant said the ladies in waiting for they all had a smattering of french one spoke it worse than the other how oh, that bird reminds me of our lamented empress's music box said an old courtier ah yes they are the same tunes and the same beautiful execution so they are said the emperor and he cried like a little child i should hardly think it could be a real one said the princess yes it is a real one said those who had brought it oh let that bird fly away then said the princess and she would not hear of allowing the prince to come but he was not to be crushed he stained his face brown and black and pressing his cap over his eyes he knocked at the door good morning emperor said he can i be taken into service in the palace well there are so many wishing to do that said the emperor but let me see yes i need somebody to look after the pigs for we have so many of them so the prince was made imperial swineherd a horrid little room was given to him near the pigsties and here he had to live he sat busily at work all day and by the evening he had made a beautiful little cooking pot it had bells all round it and when the pot boiled they tinkled delightfully and played the old tune ach du lieber augustin all east west week alas dear augustin all is lost lost but the greatest charm of all about it was that by holding one's finger in the steam one could immediately smell all the dinners that were being cooked at every stove in the town now this was a very different matter from a rose the princess came walking along with all her ladies in waiting and when she heard the tune she stopped and looked pleased for she could play ach du lieber augustine herself it was her only tune and she could only play it with one finger why that is my tune she said this must be a cultivated swineherd go and ask him what the instrument costs so one of the ladies-in-waiting had to go into his room but she put her pattens on first how much do you want for the pot she asked 
I must have ten kisses from the princess, said the swineherd. Heaven preserve us, said the lady. I won't take less, said the swineherd. Well, what does he say? asked the princess. I really cannot tell you, said the lady-in-waiting. It is so shocking. Then you must whisper it. And she whispered it. He is a wretch, said the princess, and went away at once. But she had only gone a little way when she heard the bells tinkling beautifully. Ach, du lieber Augustine. Go and ask him if he will take ten kisses from the ladies in waiting. No, thank you, said the swineherd. Ten kisses from the princess, or I keep my part. How tiresome it is, said the princess. Then you will have to stand round me, so that no one may see. So the ladies-in-waiting stood round her and spread out their skirts, while the swineherd took his ten kisses, and then the pot was hers. What a delight it was to them! The pot was kept on the boil day and night. They knew what was cooking on every stove in the town, from the chamberlains to the shoemakers. The ladies-in-waiting danced about and clapped their hands. We know who has sweet soup and pancakes for dinner and who has cutlets. How amusing it is! Highly interesting, said the mistress of the robes. Yes, but hold your tongues, for I am the emperor's daughter. Heaven preserve us, they all said. The swineherd, that is to say the prince, only nobody knew that he was not a real swineherd, did not let the day pass in idleness, and he now constructed a rattle. When it was swung round, it played all the waltzes, gallops, and jig tunes which have ever been heard since the creation of the world. But this is superb, said the princess as she walked by. I have never heard final compositions. Go and ask him what the instrument costs. But let us have no more kissing. He wants a hundred kisses from the princess, said the lady-in-waiting. I think he is mad, said the princess and she went away, but she had not gone far when she stopped. One must encourage art, she said. I am the emperor's daughter. Tell him he can have ten kisses, the same as yesterday, and he can take the others from the ladies-in-waiting. But we don't like that at all, said the ladies. Oh, nonsense! If I can kiss him, you can do the same. Remember that I pay your wages as well as give you board and lodging. So the lady-in-waiting had to go again. A hundred kisses from the princess, or let each keep his own. Stand in front of me, said she, and all the ladies stood round while he kissed her. Whatever is the meaning of that crowd round the pigsties? said the emperor, as he stepped out onto the veranda. He rubbed his eyes and put on his spectacles. Why, it is the ladies-in-waiting. What game are they up to? I must go and see. So he pulled up the heels of his slippers, for they were shoes which he had trodden down. Bless us, what a hurry he was in! When he got into the yard, he walked very softly, and the ladies were so busy counting the kisses, so that there should be fair play, and neither too few nor too many kisses, that they never heard the emperor. He stood on tiptoe. What is all this? he said when he saw what was going on and he hit them on the head with his slipper, just as the swineherd was taking the eighty-sixth kiss. "'Out you go,' said the emperor, for he was furious, and both the princess and the prince were put out of his realm. There she stood crying, and the swineherd scolded, and the rain poured down in torrents. "'Oh, miserable creature that I am! If only I had accepted the handsome prince!' Oh, how unhappy I am! The swineherd went behind a tree, wiped the black and brown stain from his face, and threw away his ugly clothes. Then he stepped out dressed as a prince. He was so handsome that the princess could not help curtsying to him. I am come to despise thee, he said. Thou wouldst not have an honorable prince. Thou couldst not prize the rose or the nightingale. But thou wouldst kiss the swineherd for a trumpery musical box. As thou hast made thy bed, so must thou lie upon it. Then he went back into his own little kingdom and shut and locked the door. So she had to stand outside and sing in earnest. Ach, 
du lieber Augustin, allmist bist weg. Allah has dear Augustin, all is lost, lost. End of section 41. Recording by Michelle Furlong. Section 42 of Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Davis. Fairy Tales from Hans Christian Andersen, translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. The Traveling Companion. Poor John was very sad. His father was ill, and he knew that he could not recover. There was no one else in the little room besides these two. It was quite late at night, and the lamp had nearly burned out. You have been a good son, John, said the dying man. I am sure the Lord will help you on in the world. And he fixed his mild, gentle eyes upon his son, drew a long breath, and passed away so quietly he only seemed to be asleep. John wept bitterly, for now he had nobody in the world belonging to him, neither father nor mother sister nor brother. Poor John. He knelt by the bedside and kissed his dead father's hands and shed many tears. But at last his eyes closed and he fell asleep with his head against the hard bedpost. He had a wonderful dream. He saw the sun and moon bowing before him and he saw his father quite well and strong again. He laughed as he always used to laugh when he was very pleased. A lovely girl with a golden crown on her long beautiful hair stretched out her hand to John and his father said, See what a beautiful bride you have won? She is the loveliest maiden in the world. Then he woke up, and all the beautiful things were gone. His father lay on the bed, dead and cold. There was no one else there. Poor John. The dead man was buried in the following week. John walked close behind the coffin, and he could no longer see his good father, who he had loved so much. He heard the earth fall upon the coffin lid, and watched it till only a corner was left. Then the last shovelful fell upon it, and it was entirely hidden. He was so miserable he felt as if his heart would break. A beautiful psalm was being sung which brought the tears into his eyes. He wept, and this brought him relief. The sun was shining brightly on the green trees and seemed to say, Do not be so sad, John. See how blue the sky is? Your good father is up there and he will pray to God that all may be well with you. I will always be good, said John, and then I shall go to heaven some time to see my father, and what joy it will be to see each other again. How much I shall have to tell him, and how he will have so much to show me and teach me about the bliss of heaven, just as he used to teach me here on earth. Oh, what joy it will be! John saw it all so vividly that he smiled at the thought although the tears still ran down his cheeks. The little birds in the chestnut tree twittered with joy, although they had been at the funeral, but they knew that the dead man was in heaven, and that he now had wings larger and more beautiful than their own. They knew, too, that he was happy, because he had been a good man here on earth, and they were glad of it. John saw them fly away from the trees and into the world, and he felt a strong desire to fly away with them. But first he made a wooden cross to put on his father's grave. When he brought it along in the evening, he found the grave covered with sand and decorated with flowers. This had been done by strangers for love of his father. Early the next morning, John packed his little bundle and stowed away his sole inheritance in his belt. It only consisted of fifty dollars and a few silver coins. And with these he started out into the world. But first he went to the churchyard to his father's grave, where he knelt and said the Lord's Prayer, and then added, Farewell, dear father. I will always be good, and then you won't be afraid to pray to the good God that all may go well with me. The fields that John passed through were full of bright flowers nodding their heads in the warm sunshine as much as to say, Welcome to the fields. Is it not lovely here? But John turned round once more to look at the old church where he had been baptized and where he had gone every Sunday and sung the psalms with his good old father. On looking back, he saw, standing in one of the loopholes of the tower, the little church niche, with his pointed red cap, shading his eyes from the sun with his arm. John nodded goodbye to him, 
and the little Nietzsche waved his hand and kissed his fingers to him to show that he was sending his good wishes for a pleasant journey. John now began to think how many beautiful things he would see in the great beautiful world before him, and he went on and on till he found himself much further away than he had ever been before. He did not know the towns through which he had passed or the people he met. He was quite among strangers. The first night he had slept under the haystack in a field for he had no other bed. But he thought it was lovely. No king could have had a better. The field by the river, the haystack, the deep blue sky above made a charming room. The green grass dotted with red and white flowers was the carpet. The elders and the rose bushes were growing bouquets, and he had the whole river for a bath, with its clear fresh water, and the rushes which nodded their heads, bidding him both good night and good morning. The moon was a great night light, high up under the blue ceiling, one which would never set fire to the curtains. John could sleep quite quietly without fear, and this he also did. He only woke when the sun was high up in the sky and all the little birds were singing, Good morning, good morning, are you not up yet? The bells were ringing for church. People were on their way to hear the parson pray and preach, and John went with them. He sang a psalm and listened to the word of God, and he felt as if he were in his own old church where he had been christened and where he had sung the psalms with his father. There were a great many graves in the churchyard, and some of them were overgrown with long grass. John thought of his father's grave, which some day might look like these when he was no longer there to weed and trim them. So he knelt down, pulled up the long grass, and raised the wooden crosses that had fallen down. He picked up the wreaths which had been blown away and replaced them, thinking that perhaps someone would do the same for his father's grave now that he was away. An old beggar was standing outside the churchyard leaning on a crutch, and John gave him the few silver coins he had left, and then went happily and cheerfully on into the wide world. Towards evening a fearful storm came up, and John hurried to get under shelter. But it soon grew dark. At last he reached a little church standing on a solitary hill. The door was ajar, and he slipped in to take shelter till the storm was over. I will sit down here in a corner till the storm is over, he said. I am quite tired and in need of a rest. So he sat down, folded his hands, said his evening prayer, and before he was aware he was asleep and dreaming, while it thundered and lightened outside. When he woke up it was the middle of the night, and the storm was over. The moon was shining in upon him through the windows. In the middle of the aisle stood an open coffin with a dead man in it, who was not yet buried. John was not at all afraid, for he had a good conscience, and he knew that the dead can do no harm. It is living wicked people who do harm to others. There were two such bad men standing by the coffin. They had come to do harm to this poor dead man, to turn him out of his coffin and throw the body outside the church door. Why do you want to do this? asked John. It is very wicked and disgraceful. Let the man rest for heaven's sake. Oh, nonsense, replied the wretches. He cheated us. He owed us money which he could not pay, and now he has gone and died into the bargain and we shall never see a penny, so we want to revenge ourselves. He shall lie like a dog outside the church doors. I have not got more than fifty dollars, said John. It is my whole inheritance, but I will gladly give it to you if you will honestly promise me to leave this poor dead man in peace. I shall manage very well without the money. I have good, strong limbs, and the Lord will always help me. Well, said the bad man, if you are ready to pay his debt like that, we won't do him any harm, we can assure you. And they took the money John gave them, laughing at him for being such a simpleton, and then they went away. John put the body straight again, folded the hands, said goodbye, and went away through the woods in a state of great satisfaction. Around him the moon pierced through the trees. He saw numbers of little elves playing about merrily. They did not disturb themselves on his account. They knew very well that he was a good, innocent person, and it was only bad people who never see the fairies. Some of them were no bigger than one's finger, and they had long yellow hair fastened up with golden combs. They swung hand in hand upon the big dewdrops which covered the leaves and the long grass. Sometimes the dewdrops rolled down, and then they fell with it down among the grass, and this caused great noise and laughter among the little folk. It was very amusing. They sang all the pretty little songs John used to know when he was a little boy. 
Great spiders with silver crowns upon their heads spun their webs from branch to branch like bridges connecting palaces. They glittered in the moonlight like glass where the dew had fallen on them. They went on with their sports till the sun rose and the little creatures crept away into the flower buds, and the wind caught the bridges and palaces and swept them away into the air like cobwebs. John had just got through the wood when a strong man's voice called out behind him. Hello, comrade. Whither away? Out into the world, said John. I have neither father nor mother. I am only a poor lad, but the Lord will protect me. I am going out into the wild world too, said the stranger. Shall we go together? By all means, said John. And so they walked on together. They soon grew much attached to each other, for they were both good men. But John soon saw that the stranger was much wiser than himself. He had been around the greater part of the world, and he was well able to describe all that he had seen. The sun was already high when they sat down under a big tree to eat their breakfast, and just then an old woman came up. She was very old and bent and walked with a crutch. She had a bundle of sticks she had picked up in the wood on her back, and her apron was fastened up, and John could see in it three bundles or faggots of dried fern and some willow twigs. When she got near them, her foot slipped, and she fell with a loud shriek. The poor old woman had broken her leg. John wanted to carry her home, but the stranger opened his knapsack and took out a little pot of salve, which he said would make her leg well directly, and she would be able to walk home as well as if she had never broken it. But in payment for it, he wanted the three bundles of fern she had in her apron. That is very good payment, said the old woman, nodding her head rather oddly. She did not want to part with her three bundles of fern, but it was not so pleasant to lie there with a broken leg, so she gave him the faggots. As soon as he had rubbed on the salve, the old woman got up and walked away faster than she had been able to do before. This was all the effect of the salve, but no other ointment as this was to be had at any chemist's. What do you want to do with the bundles of ferns? said John to his companion. They make very good birch rods and they are just what I like. I am a very queer fellow, you know. Then they walked on for a good bit. What a storm is drawing up there, said John, pointing before him. Those are terribly black clouds. No, said the fellow traveler. Those are not clouds. They are mountains, beautiful high mountains, where you can get right above the clouds into the fresh air. It is splendid up there. Tomorrow we shall just reach them. They were not so near, however, as they seemed to be. It took them a whole day to reach the mountains, where the dark forests grew right up towards the sky, and where there were great boulders as big as houses or even towns. It would be a heavy task to climb over all these, and so John and his fellow traveler went into an inn to rest and refresh themselves before they made the ascent the next day. There were a number of people in the parlor at the inn, for there was a man showing off some marionettes. He had just put up his little theater, and the people were sitting round waiting for the play to begin. A fat old butcher had taken up his place in the middle of the front row, and he had a ferocious-looking bulldog by his side, and it sat staring just as hard as anybody else. Then the comedy began, and it was a very pretty play, with a king and a queen in it. They sat on a velvet throne with golden crowns on their heads, and trains, for they could well afford it. The prettiest little wooden dolls stood by at the doors. They had bright glass eyes and big whiskers, and they were employed in opening and shutting the doors to let in the fresh air. It was a capital play, and not at all a tragic one, but just as the queen got up to talk across the floor, heaven knows what idea entered the bulldog's head, but finding that the butcher was not holding him, he made a great leap forward right into the middle of the theater and seized the queen by the slender waist and crunched her head up. It was a terrible disaster. The poor showman was quite frightened and also very sad about his queen, for she was his prettiest doll, and the horrid bulldog had entirely ruined her. But when all the people had gone away, John's fellow traveler said he could make her all right again, and he took out his little pot and rubbed some of the same ointment onto the doll which had cured the poor old woman who had broken her leg. As soon as ever the doll had been rubbed over with the ointment, she became whole again. Nay, she could even move all her limbs herself. It was no longer necessary to pull the wires. The doll was exactly like a living being, except that she could not speak. The showman was delighted, 
because now he did not have to hold the wires at all for this doll, as she could dance quite well by herself, and none of the others could do that. At night, when everybody had gone to bed, someone was heard sighing most dolefully, and it went on so long that everybody got up to see who it could be. The showman went along to his theater, because that was where the sighs seemed to come from. All the wooden dolls were lying in a heap. It was the king and his guards who were sighing so dismally and staring with their glass eyes. They all wanted to be rubbed with some of the same ointment as the queen, so that they might be able to move their limbs as well as she did. She threw herself down on her knees and stretched out her hands with her golden crown, saying, Please, take this, but do please rub some of the ointment onto my consort and the courtiers. The poor man who owned the theater and the marionettes could not help crying. He was so sorry for them. He immediately promised the traveling companion that he would give him all the money he possessed if he would only anoint five or six of the prettiest dolls. But the traveling companion said that he did not want anything except the big sword that the showman wore on his side, and as soon as it was given him he anointed six dolls. They began to dance around at once so prettily that all the real living girls who saw them began to dance too. The coachman and the cook, the waiter and the chambermaid, and all the strangers joined in, as well as the shovel and the tongs, but those two fell on top of each other just as they were making their first bound. It was indeed a lively night. Next morning, John and his traveling companion went away from them all, up to the high mountains through the great pine forest. They got so high that at last the church towers far below looked like little red berries among all the green, and they could see far away for many, many miles to places where they had never been. John had never seen so many of the beauties of this beautiful world altogether before. The warm sun shone brightly in the clear blue sky, and the huntsman was heard winding his horn among the mountains. It was all so peaceful and sweet that it brought tears to his eyes, and he could not help exclaiming, Great God, I could fall down and kiss the hem of thy garment out of gratitude for all thy good gifts to us. His traveling companion also stood with folded hands looking at the woods and the villages, basking in the warm sunshine. They heard a wonderful and beautiful sound above their heads and looked up. A great white swan was hovering in the air above them. It sang as they had never heard any bird sing before, but the song became fainter and fainter, and the swan gradually sank down before their feet, where it lay dead, the beautiful bird. Two such beautiful wings! said the traveling companion. Such big white ones are worth a lot of money. I will take them with me. Now you see what a good thing it is that I got this sword. And with one blow he struck off both the wings of the dead swan, for he meant to keep them. They traveled many, many miles over the mountains, till at last they saw before them a great town with over a hundred towers, which glittered like silver in the sunshine. In the middle of the town was a splendid marble palace, thatched with red gold in which the king lived. John and his traveling companion did not want to go into the town at once. They stopped at an inn outside to change their clothes, as they wished to look their best when they walked through the streets. The host told them that the king was such a good old man, he never did any harm to anyone. But his daughter, heaven preserve us, she was a wicked princess. Beauty she had more than enough of. Nobody could be so beautiful and fascinating as she was. But what was the good of it? when she was such a bad, wicked witch, who was the cause of so many handsome princes having lost their lives. She had given permission to anybody to court her. Anyone who would might come, were he prince or beggar. It was all the same to her. He only had to guess three riddles she asked him. If he could answer them, she would marry him, and he would be king over all the land when her father died. But if he failed to answer them, he either had to be hanged or to have his head cut off. So bad and so wicked was this beautiful princess. Her father, the old king, was much grieved by it, but he could not prevent her from being so wicked, for he had once said that he would never have anything to do with her lovers. She must deal with them herself as she liked. Every prince who had yet come to guess the riddles so as to gain the princess had failed, and so he had either been hanged or had his head cut off. Each one had been warned and he need not have paid his addresses unless he had liked. The old king was so grieved by all this trouble and misery that he and his soldiers spent a whole day every year on their knees 
praying that the princess might become good. But she had no intention of doing so. The old women who drank brandy dyed it black before they drank it. That was their way of mourning, and what more could they do? That vile princess, said John, she ought to be well birched. That would be the best thing for her. If I were the king, I would make her blood run. Just then he heard all the people in the streets shouting, Hurrah! The princess was passing, and she was really so beautiful that when they saw her, everyone forgot how wicked she was. And so they all shouted, Hurrah! Twelve beautiful maidens clothed in white silk, with golden tulips in their hands, rode twelve coal-black horses by her side. The princess herself was on a snow-white horse adorned with diamonds and rubies. Her riding dress was of pure gold, and the whip in her hand looked like a sunbeam. The golden crown on her head seemed to be made of little twinkling stars from the sky, and her cloak was sewn all over with thousands of beautiful butterflies' wings. But she was far, far more beautiful than all her clothes. When John saw her, his face became as red as blood, and he could hardly say a single word. The princess was the image of the beautiful girl with the golden crown whom he had seen in his dream the night his father died. He thought her so beautiful that he at once fell in love with her. It certainly could not be true, he thought, that she could be a wicked witch who allowed people to be hanged or executed if they could not guess her riddles. Any one may pay to address her, even the poorest peasant. I will go to the palace myself. I can't help going. They all said that he ought not to go, as he would only meet the same fate as the others. His traveling companion also advised him against going, but John thought he would be sure to get on all right. So he brushed his coat and his shoes, washed his hands and face, and combed his yellow hair, and then went quite alone to the town and straight up to the palace. Come in, said the old king when John knocked at the door. He opened it, and the old king in his dressing gown and slippers came towards him. He had his gold crown on his head, the scepter in one hand, and the golden ball in the other. Wait a moment, said he, tucking the ball under his arm so as to be able to shake hands with John. But as soon as he had heard that John was a suitor, he began to cry so much that both the ball and the scepter rolled onto the floor, and he had to wipe his eyes with his dressing gown. The poor old king. Leave it alone, said he. You are sure to fail, just like the others. I am convinced of it. Then he led John into the princess's pleasure garden, which was a ghastly sight. From every tree hung three or four king's sons who had come to court the princess, but who had all been unable to guess her riddles. With every gust of wind the bones rattled so that all the little birds were frightened away, and they never dared come into the garden. All the flowers were tied up to human bones in the place of stakes, and human skulls grinned out of every flower pot. It was indeed a nice garden for a princess. Here, you see, said the old king, your fate will be just the same as all these. Do give it up. It makes me most unhappy. I take it so much to heart. John kissed the old king's hand and said he thought it would be all right, for he was so fond of the beautiful princess. Just then, the beautiful princess came herself with all her ladies driving into the palace gardens, so they went up to her and said, Good morning. She was certainly very beautiful as she shook hands with John, and he was more in love with her than ever. It was impossible that she could be the wicked witch people said she was. They all went up into the hall, and the little pages brought jam and gingerbread nuts to them. But the old king was so sad he could eat nothing. Besides, the ginger nuts were too hard for him. It was now decided that John was to come up to the palace the next morning, when the judges and all the council would be assembled to hear if he could guess the first riddle. If he succeeded the first time, he would have to come twice more. But nobody yet had ever guessed the first riddle. He had lost his life at once. John was not a bit alarmed about this. He was delighted, and only thought of the lovely princess. He felt quite certain that the good God would help him, but in what manner it would be he had not the slightest idea nor did he trouble his head about it. He danced along the highway when he went back to the inn where his traveling companion was waiting for him. John was never tired of telling him how charming the princess had been towards him and how lovely she was. He was longing for the next day to come when he was able to go to the palace to try his luck with the riddles. But his traveling companion shook his head 
and was quite sad. I am so fond of you, he said. We might have been companions for a long time yet, and now I shall lose you directly. My poor dear John, I could weep over you, but I will not spoil your pleasure on this last evening we perhaps spend together. We will be merry, as merry as possible. Tomorrow, when you are gone, I can be sad. Everybody in the inn had heard directly that a new suitor had come for the princess, and there was general murmuring. The theater was closed, and all the cake women tied black crepe around their sugar pigs. The king and the priests were praying on their knees in the churches, and there was universal grief, for they all knew that there could be no better fate in store for John than for the other suitors. Late in the evening, the traveling companion made a great bowl of punch and said to John that they must be merry now and drink the princess's health. But when John had drunk two glasses, he became so sleepy that he could not hold up his head, and he fell fast asleep. His traveling companion lifted him quietly from his chair and laid him on his bed. As soon as it was dark, he took the two big wings which he had cut off the swan and tied them onto his own shoulders. Then he put the biggest bunch of twigs which he had gotten from the old woman who had broken her leg into his pocket, opened the window, and flew over the roofs of the houses right up to the palace, where he sat down in a corner under the window of the princess's bedroom. The whole town was quiet. As the clock struck the quarter before twelve, the window was opened, and the princess flew out in a great white cloak and long black wings. She flew over the town to a great mountain, but the traveling companion made himself invisible and flew behind her, raining blows on her back with his birch rod till the blood flowed. Oh, what a flight that was through the air! The wind caught her cloak, which spread out on every side like the sail of a ship, and the moon shone through it. How it hails! How it hails! said the princess at every blow, but she richly deserved it. At last they reached the mountain and knocked. There was a rumble as the thunder. The side of the mountain opened, and the princess went in, closely followed by the traveling companion. No one saw him, as he was quite invisible. They went through a long passage, which glittered curiously, owing to thousands of shining spiders which swarmed over the walls, shedding a fiery light. They next reached a great hall built of gold and silver, with red and blue flowers as big as sunflowers all over the walls. No one could pick these flowers, for the stems were poisonous snakes, and the flowers were flames coming out of their mouths. The ceiling was covered with shining glowworms and pale blue bats which flapped their transparent wings. This had an extraordinary effect. In the middle of the floor was a throne supported by four horses' legs and harnesses of red fiery spiders. The throne itself was of milky glass, and the cushions were made of little black mice holding on to each other by the tails. There was a canopy above it of rose-colored spider's web, dotted with the most exquisite little green flies which glittered like diamonds. A hideous old ogre sat in the middle of the throne, with a crown on his ugly head and a scepter in his hand. He kissed the princess on her forehead and made her sit down by him on the costly throne. Then the music began. Great black grasshoppers played upon juice harps, and the owl beat upon his own stomach in place of a drum. It was a most absurd concert. Numbers of tiny little elves, each with a firefly on their little caps, danced round the hall. No one could see the traveling companion, but he could see and hear everything from behind the throne where he had placed himself. The courtiers, who now made their appearance, looked most grand and proper, but any one who could really see perceived at once what they were. They were merely broomsticks with cabbages for heads, into which the ogre had put life by his magic powers and dressed them up in embroidered clothes but this did not matter a bit, for they were only used on grand occasions. After the dancing had gone on for a time, the princess told the ogre that she had another suitor, and asked him what she had better think of to put as a riddle for the next day. Listen, said the ogre, I will tell you what. You must think of something very simple, and then he will never think of it. Let us say one of your own shoes. He will never guess that. Then have his head chopped off, but don't forget when you come here tomorrow night to bring me his eyes. I want to eat them. The princess curtsied low and said that she would not forget the eyes. The ogre opened the mountain and she flew home again. And as before, the traveling companion followed her closely 
and beat her so hard with the birch rod that she groaned at the terrible hailstorm and hurried back as fast as she could to her bedroom window. The traveling companion flew back to the inn, where he found John still fast asleep. He took off his own clothes and went to bed too, for he had a good right to be tired. John woke up early in the morning, and the traveling companion got up at the same time and told him that he had had a wonderful dream about the princess and her shoe, and he begged John to ask the princess if she had not thought of her shoe. This was, of course, what he had heard the ogre say in the mountain, but he did not want to tell John anything about that, so he merely told him that it was a dream. I may as well ask that as anything else, said John. Perhaps your dream will come true, for I always think God will help me. All the same, I will say goodbye, for if I guess wrong, you will never see me again. So they kissed each other, and John went to the town and up to the palace. The hall was full of people. The judges were seated in their armchairs, and they had down pillows under their heads, for they had so much to think about. The old king stood near, wiping his eyes with a white pocket handkerchief. The princess came in, greeted everyone very pleasantly, and she was even lovelier than yesterday. She shook hands with John and said, Good morning to you. Now John had to guess what she had thought of. She looked at him most sweetly, but as soon as she heard him say the word shoe, she turned as white as a sheet and trembled all over. But that was no good, for he had guessed right. Preserve us! How pleased the king was! He turned head over heels without stopping, and everybody clapped their hands both on his account and on John's, whose first guess had been right. The traveling companion beamed with delight when he heard how successful John had been. But John folded his hands and thanked God, who no doubt would also help him on the two following occasions. The next day was fixed for the second riddle. The evening passed, just as the previous one had done. When John had gone to sleep, the traveling companion flew behind the princess to the mountain, and he beat her harder than ever, for this time he had taken two birch rods with him. Nobody could see him, and he heard everything as before. The princess was to think of her glove, and this he told John just as if it had been a dream. John, of course, could easily guess all right, and again there was great delight in the palace. The whole court turned somersaults as they had seen the king do the first time, but the princess lay on the sofa and would not say a single word. Now all turned upon whether John guessed the third riddle or not. If he did, he would win the princess and inherit the whole kingdom when the old king died. But if he was wrong, he would lose his life and the ogre would eat his beautiful blue eyes. The evening before, John went early to bed, said his prayers, and slept as peacefully as possible. But the traveling companion tied the wings onto his back and bound the sword around his waist, took all the birch rods, and flew off to the palace. It was a pitch-dark night. There was such a gale that the tiles flew off the roofs, and the trees in the garden of bones bent like reeds before the wind. The lightning flashed every moment, and the thunder rolled continuously the whole night long. The window burst open, and the princess flew out. She was as pale as death, but she laughed at the storm as if it were not bad enough. Her white mantle swirled about in the wind like the sails of a ship. The traveling companion beat her with his three birches till the blood dripped onto the ground. She could hardly fly any further. At last they reached the mountain. What a hailstorm there is, she said as she entered. I have never been out in such a bad one. One may even have too much of a good thing, said the ogre. Then she told him that John's second guess had been right and if he was successful again in the morning she would never be able to come and see him again in the mountain, nor would she ever be able to do any more of the sorcerer's tricks as before, and she was very sad about it. He shall never guess it, said the ogre. I shall think of something that will never enter his head, but we will have some fun first. And he took the princess by both hands, and they danced round the room with all the little elves and the fireflies. The red spiders ran merrily up and down the walls, and the fire flowers seemed to give out sparks. The owls played their drums, the crickets chirped, and the grasshoppers played their harps. It was a very gay ball. After they had danced some time, the princess was obliged to go home where she would be missed, and the ogre said he would go with her so as to have more of her company. So away they flew through the storm, and the traveling companion wore out his birch rods on their backs. Never had the ogre been out in such a hailstorm. He said goodbye to the princess outside the palace and whispered to her, 
think of my head. But the traveling companion heard what he said, and at the very moment when the princess slipped into her window and the ogre was turning away to go back, he seized him by his long black beard, and before he had time to look round, cut off his head close to the shoulders with his big sword. He threw the body into the sea to be food for the fishes, but he only dipped the head into the water and tied it up in his silk handkerchief and took it back to the inn, and then he went to bed. Next morning he gave John the handkerchief, but said he must not open it before the princess asked him what she had thought about. There were so many people in the hall that they were packed as close together as a bundle of radishes. The judges were sitting in their armchairs with the soft down cushions, and the old king had his new clothes on, and his crown and scepter had been polished up and looked quite festive. But the princess was very, very pale, and she was dressed in black as if for a funeral. What have I thought of? she asked John, and he immediately untied the handkerchief and was very much frightened himself when he saw the hideous ogre's head. A shudder ran through the whole assemblage, but the princess seemed turned to stone and could not say a single word. At last she got up and gave her hand to John, for he had guessed all of her riddles. She looked neither to the right nor to the left, but sighed deeply and said, You are my master now. Our wedding shall take place tonight. I like that, said the old king. That is just as it should be. All the people shouted, Hurrah! The king's band played in the streets. The bells rang. The cake women took the crepe off their sugar pigs, because all was now rejoicing. Three oxen stuffed with chickens and ducks were roasted whole in the marketplace, and every one could cut off a portion for themselves. The fountains played wine instead of water, and any one who bought a penny roll had six large buns full of plums given in. In the evening the whole town was illuminated. The soldiers fired salutes, and the boys let off squibs and crackers. At the palace all was eating and drinking, toasting and dancing. The grand gentlemen danced with the pretty ladies, and the singing could be heard far and wide. But the princess was still bewitched, and she did not care a bit about John. The traveling companion knew this and gave him three feathers out of the swan's wings and a little bottle with a few drops of the liquid in it. He told John to have a large bath full of water placed by the side of the bed, and when the princess was going to get into bed, he must give her a little push so that she fell into the water where he was to dip her three times, first having thrown the three feathers and the drops of liquid into it. She would then be released from the spell and would grow very fond of him. John did everything as he was told. The princess shrieked when he dipped her into the water and struggled in his hands in the form of a black swan with glittering eyes. The second time she came up as a white swan, except for a black ring around the neck. John prayed humbly to God, and the third time she came up as a lovely princess. She was more lovely than she had been before, and thanked him with tears in her eyes for having released her from the spell. Next morning, the old king came with all his courtiers to offer their congratulations, and this went on all day. Last of all came the traveling companion. He had his stick in his hand and his knapsack on his back. John kissed him over and over and said that he must not go away. He must stay with them, as he was the cause of all their happiness. But the traveling companion shook his head and said gently and tenderly, No, my time is up. I have only paid my debt. Do you remember the dead man whom you prevented the wicked men from disturbing? You gave all that you possessed so that he might have rest in his grave. I am the dead man and then he immediately vanished. The wedding festivities lasted a whole month. John and the princess were devoted to each other, and the old king had many happy days in which to let the children play ride the cockhorse on his knee and to play with his scepter. But John was king over the whole country. End of section 42《セクション43のフェリー・タイルズ・フォン・ハンズ・クリスチャン・アンデルソン》。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Evan Smith.《フェリー・タイルズ・フォン・ハンズ・クリスチャン・アンデルソン》。Translated by Mrs. Edgar Lucas. The Wind's Tale。When the wind sweeps across a field of grass, it makes little ripples in it like a lake. In a field of corn, it makes great waves like the sea itself. This is the wind's frolic. Then listen to the stories it tells. 
it sings them aloud, one kind of song among the trees of the forest, and a very different one when it is pent up within walls, with all their cracks and crannies. Do you see how the wind chases the white fleecy clouds as if they were a flock of sheep? Do you hear the wind down there, howling in the open doorway like a watchman winding his horn? Then, too, how he whistles in the chimneys, making the fire crackle and sparkle. How cozy it is to sit in the warm glow of the fire, listening to the tales it has to tell. Let the wind tell its own story. It can tell you more adventures than all of us put together. Listen now. Phew, phew, fare away. That was the refrain of his song. Close to the great belt stands an old mansion with thick red walls, said the wind. I know every stone of it. I knew them before when they formed part of Marsk Stig's castle on the Ness. It had to come down. The stones were used again and made a new wall of a new castle in another place, Boraby Hall as it now stands. I have watched uh, the high-born men and women of all the various races who have lived there, and now I'm going to tell you about Valdemar Da and his daughters. He held his head very high, for he came of a royal stock. He knew more than the mere chasing of a stag or the emptying of a flagon. He knew how to manage his affairs, he said himself. His lady wife walked proudly across the brightly polished floors in her gold brocaded kirtle. The tapestries in the rooms were gorgeous and the furniture of costly carved woods. She had brought much gold and silver plate into the house with her, and the cellars were full of German ale, when there was anything there at all. Fiery black horses neighed in the stables. Borroby Hall was a very rich place when wealth came there. Then there were the children, three dainty maidens, Ida, Johanna, and Anna Dorothea. I remember their names well. They were rich and aristocratic people, and they were born and bred in wealth. Phew, phew, fare away, roared the wind. Then he went on with his story. I did not see here, as in other old noble castles, the high-born lady sitting among her maidens in the great hall, turning the spinning wheel. No, she played upon the ringing lute and sang its tones. Her songs were not always the old Danish ditties, however, but songs in foreign tongues. All was life and hospitality, Noble guests came from far and wide. There were sounds of music and the clanging of flagons so loud that I could not drown them, said the wind. Here were arrogance and ostentation enough and to spare. Plenty of lords, but the lord had no place there. Then came the evening of May Day, said the wind, and I came from the west. I had been watching ships being wrecked and broken up on the west coast of Jutland. I tore over the heaths and the green wooded coasts, across the island of Funen, and over the great belt, puffing and blowing. I settled down to rest on the coast of Zealand, close to the Borroby Hall, where the splendid forest of oaks still stood. The young bachelors of the neighborhood came out and collected faggots and branches, the longest and driest they could find. These they took to the town, piled them up in a heap, and set fire to them. Then the men and maidens danced and sang round the bonfire. I lay still, said the wind, but I softly moved a branch, the one laid by the handsomest young man, and his billet blazed up highest of all. He was the chosen one. He had the name of honor. He became buck of the street, and he chose from among the girls his little May lamb. All was life and merriment greater far than within rich Borroby Hall. The great lady came driving towards the hall, in her gilded chariot drawn by six horses. She had her three dainty daughters with her. They were indeed three lovely flowers, a rose, a lily, and a pale hyacinth. The mother herself was a gorgeous tulip. She took no notice whatever of the crowd, who all stopped in their game to drop their curtsies and make their bows. One might have thought that, like a tulip, she was rather frail in the stalk and feared to bend her back. The rose, the lily, and the pale hyacinth, yes, I saw them all three. Whose may lambs were they one day to become, thought I? Their mates would be proud knights, perhaps even princes. Phew, phew, fare away. 
Yes, the chariot bore them away, and the peasants whirled on in their dance. They played at riding the summer into the village, to Boroughby village, Terraby village, and many others. But that night when I rose, said the wind, the noble lady laid herself down to rise no more. That came to her which comes to every one. There was nothing new about it. Valdemar Da stood grave and silent for a time. The proudest tree may bend, but it does not break, said something within him. The daughters wept, and everyone else at the castle was wiping their eyes. But Madame Da had fared away, and I fared away too. Phew, phew, said the wind. I came back again. I often came back across the island of Funen and the waters of the belt, and took up my place on Boroughby shore, close to the great forest of oaks. The ospreys and the wood pigeons used to build in it, the blue raven and even the black stork. It was early in the year. Some of the nests were full of eggs, while in others the young ones were just hatched. What a flying and screaming was there! Then came the sound of the axe, blow upon blow. The forest was to be felled. Valdemar Da was about to build a costly ship, a three-decked man-of-war, which it was expected the king would buy. So the wood fell, the ancient landmark of the seamen, the home of the birds. The shrike was frightened away, its nest was torn down. The osprey and all the other birds lost their nest too, and they flew about distractedly, shrieking in their terror and anger. The crows and the jackdaws screamed in mockery, Caw! Caw! Valdemar Da and his three daughters stood in the middle of the wood among the workmen. They all laughed at the wild cries of the birds, except Anna Dorothea, who was touched by their distress. And when they were about to fell a tree which was half dead, and on whose naked branches a black stork had built its nest, out of which the young ones were sticking their heads, she begged them, with tears in her eyes, to spare it. So the tree with the black stork's nest was allowed to stand. It was only a little thing. The chopping and the sawing went on. The three-decker was built. The master builder was a man of humble origin, but of noble loyalty. Great power lay in his eyes and on his forehead, and Valdemar Da liked to listen to him, and little Ida liked to listen too, the eldest fifteen-year-old daughter. But whilst he built a ship for her father, he built a castle in the air for himself, in which he and little Ida sat side by side as man and wife. This might also have happened if his castle had been built of solid stone, with moat and ramparts, wood and gardens. But with all his wisdom, the shipbuilder was only a poor bird, and what business has a sparrow in a crane's nest? Phew, phew, I rushed away, and he rushed away, for he dared not stay, and little Ida got over it, as get over it she must. The fiery black horses stood neighing in the stables. They were worth looking at, and they were looked at to some purpose, too. An admiral was sent from the king to look at the new war man of war, with a view to purchasing it. The admiral was loud in his admiration of the horses. "'I heard all he said,' added the wind. "'I went through the open door with the gentlemen, and scattered the straw like gold before their feet. Valdemar Da wanted gold.' The admiral wanted the black horses, and so he praised them as he did. But his hints were not taken, therefore the ship remained unsold. There it stood by the shore, covered up with boards like a Noah's Ark, which never reached the water. Phew, phew, get along, get along. It was a miserable business. In the winter, when the fields were covered with snow, and the belt was full of ice floes, which I drove up on to the coast, said the wind, the ravens and crows came in flocks, the one blacker than the other, and perched upon the desolate dead ship by the shore. They screamed themselves hoarse about the forest which had disappeared, and the many precious birds' nests which had been devastated, leaving old and young homeless, and all for the sake of this old piece of lumber, the proud ship which was never to touch the water. I whirled the snow about till it lay in great heaps round the ship, I let it hear my voice, and all that a storm has to say. I know that I did my best to give it an idea of the sea. Phew! Phew! The winter passed by. Winter and summer passed away. They come and go just as I do. The snowflakes, the apple blossom, and the leaves fall, each in their turn. 
Phew, phew, they pass away as men pass too. The daughters were still young. Little Ida, the rose, as lovely to look at as when the shipbuilder turned his gaze upon her. I often took hold of her long brown hair when she stood lost in thought by the apple tree in the garden. She never noticed that I showered apple blossoms over her loosened hair. She only gazed at the red sunset against the golden background of the sky and the dark trees and bushes of the garden. Her sister Johanna was like a tall, stately lily. She held herself as stiffly erect as her mother and seemed to have the same dread of bending her stem. She liked to walk in the long gallery where the family portraits hung. The ladies were painted in velvet and silk, with tiny pearl-embroidered caps on their braided tresses. Their husbands were all clad in steel, or in costly cloaks lined with squirrel skins and stiff blue ruffs. Their swords hung loosely by their sides. Where would Johanna's portrait one day hang on these walls? What would her noble husband look like? These were her thoughts, and she even spoke them aloud. I heard her as I swept through the long corridor into the gallery, where I veered round again. Anna Dorothea, the pale hyacinth, was only a child of fourteen, quiet and thoughtful. Her large blue eyes, as clear as water, were very solemn, but childhood's smile still played upon her lips. I could not blow it away, nor did I wish to do so. I used to meet her in the garden, the ravine, and in the manor fields. She was always picking flowers and herbs, those she knew her father could use for healing drinks and potions. Valdemar Da was proud and conceited, but he was also learned, and he knew a great deal about many things. One could see that, and many whispers went about as to his learning. The fire blazed in his stove even in summer, and his chamber door was locked. This went on for days and nights, but he did not talk much about it. One must deal silently with the forces of nature. He would soon discover the best of everything, the red, red gold. This was why his chimney flamed and smoked and sparkled. Yes, I was there too, said the wind. Away with you, away, I sang in the back of the chimney. Smoke, smoke, embers and ashes, that is all it will come to. You will burn yourself up in it. Phew, phew, away with it. But Valdemar Da could not let it go. The fiery steeds in the stable, where were they? The old gold and silver plate in the cupboard and chest, where was that? The cattle, the land, the castle itself. Yes, they could all be melted down in the crucible, but yet no gold would come. Barn and larder got emptier and emptier. Fewer servants, more mice. One pane of glass got broken, and another followed it. There was no need for me to go in by the doors, said the wind. A smoking chimney means a cooking meal. But the only chimney which smoked here swallowed up all the meals, all for the sake of the red gold. I blew through the castle gate like a watchman blowing his horn, but there was no watchman, said the wind. I twisted round the weathercock on the tower, and it creaked as if the watchman up there was snoring, only there was no watchman. Rats and mice were the only inhabitants. Poverty laid the table. Poverty lurked in wardrobe and larder. The doors fell off their hinges. Cracks and crannies appeared everywhere. I went in and out, said the wind, so I know all about it. The hair and the beard of Valdemar Da grew grey, in the sorrow of his sleepless nights, amid smoke and ashes. His skin grew grimy and yellow, and his eyes greedy for gold, the long-expected gold. I whistled through the broken panes and fissures. I blew into the daughters' chests where their clothes lay faded and threadbare. They had to last forever. A song like this had never been sung over the cradles of these children. A lordly life became a woeful life. I was the only one to sing in the castle now, said the wind. I snowed them up, for they said it gave warmth. They had no firewood, for the forest was cut down where they should have got it. There was a biting frost. Even I had to keep rushing through the crannies and passages to keep myself lively. 
They stayed in bed to keep themselves warm, those noble ladies. Their father crept about under a fur rug. Nothing to bite and nothing to burn. A lordly life indeed. Phew, phew, let it go. But this was what Valdemar Da could not do. After winter comes the spring, said he. A good time will come after a time of need. But they make us wait their pleasure. Wait. The castle is mortgaged. We are in extremities. And yet the gold will come. At Easter. I heard him murmur to the spider's web. You clever little weaver. You teach me to persevere. If your web is broken, you begin at the beginning again and complete it. Broken again and cheerfully you begin it over again. That is what one must do, and one will be rewarded. It was Easter morning. The bells were ringing, and the sun was at play in the heavens. Valdemar Da had watched through the night with his blood at fever pitch, boiling and cooling, mixing and distilling. I heard him sigh like a despairing soul. I heard him pray, and I felt that he held his breath. The lamp had gone out, but he never noticed it. I blew up the embers, and they shone upon his ashen face, which took a tinge of color from their light. His eyes startled in their sockets. They grew larger and larger, as if they would leap out. Look at the alchemist's glass. Something twinkles in it. It is glowing, pure and heavy. He lifted it with a trembling hand and shouted with a trembling voice, Gold! Gold! He reeled, and I could easily have blown him over, said the wind but I only blew upon the embers and followed him to the room where his daughter sat shivering. His coat was powdered with ash, as well as his beard and his matted hair. He drew himself up to his full height and held up his precious treasure in the fragile glass. Found! One! Gold! he cried, stretching up his hand with the glass which glittered in the sunbeams. His hand shook and the alchemist's glass fell to the ground, shivered into a thousand atoms. The last bubble of his welfare was shattered too. Phew, phew, fare away, and away I rushed from the gold-maker's home. Late in the year, when the days were short and dark up here, and the fog envelops the red berries, and the bare branches with its cold moisture, I came along in a lively mood, clearing the sky and snapping off the dead boughs. This is no great labor, it is true, yet it has to be done. Borobi Hall, the home of Valdemar Da, was having a clean sweep of a different sort. The family enemy, Ove Ramel from Basness, appeared, holding the mortgage of the hall and all its contents. I drummed upon the cracked window panes, beat against the decaying doors, and whistled through all the cracks and crannies. Phew! I did my best to prevent Herr Ove taking a fancy to stay there. Ida and Anna Dorothea faced it bravely, although they shed some tears. Johanna stood pale and erect, and bit her finger till it bled. Much that would help her. Ove Rammel offered to let them stay on at the castle for Valdemar Da's lifetime, but he got no thanks for his offer. I was listening. I saw the ruined gentleman stiffen his neck and hold his head higher than ever. I beat against the walls and the old linden trees with such force that the thickest branch broke, although it was not a bit rotten. It fell across the gate like a broom, as if someone was about to sweep, and a sweeping there was indeed to be. I quite expected it. It was a grievous day and a hard time for them but their wills were as stubborn as their necks were stiff. They had not a possession in the world but the clothes on their backs. Yes, one thing, an alchemist's glass, which had been bought and filled with the fragments scraped up from the floor. The treasure which promised much and fulfilled nothing. Valdemar Da hid it in his bosom, took his staff in his hand, and with his three daughters the once wealthy gentleman walked out of Borobi Hall for the last time. I blew a cold blast upon his burning cheeks. I fluttered his gray beard and his long white hair. I sang such a tune as only I could sing. Phew! Phew! Away with them! Away with them! This was the end of all their grandeur. Ida and Anna Dorothea walked one on each side of him. Johanna turned round at the gateway, 
But what was the good of that? Nothing could make their luck turn. She looked at the red stones of what had once been Mars Stig's castle. Was she thinking of his daughters? The elder took the younger by the hand, and out they roamed to a far-off land. Was she thinking of that song? Here there were three, and their father was with them. They walked along the road where once they used to ride in their chariot. They trod it now as vagrants on their way to a plastered cottage on Smidstrip Heath, which was rented at ten marks yearly. This was their new country seat with its empty walls and its empty vessels. The crows and the magpies wheeled screaming over their heads with their mocking caw, caw, out of the nest, caw, caw just as they screamed in Borobi Forest when the trees were felled. Herr Daw and his daughters must have noticed it. I blew into their ears to try and deaden the cries, which after all were not worth listening to. So they took up their abode in the plastered cottage on Smidstrip Heath, and I bore off over marshes and meadows, through naked hedges and bare woods, to the open seas and other lands. Phew, phew, away, away, and that for many years. What happened to Valdemar Da? What happened to his daughters? This is what the wind relates. The last of them I saw, yes, for the last time, was Anna Dorothea, the pale hyacinth. She was old and bent now. It was half a century later. She lived the longest. She had gone through everything. Across the heath, near the town of Viborg, stood the dean's new handsome mansion, built of red stone with toothed gables. The smoke curled thickly out of the chimneys. The gentle lady and her fair daughters sat in the bay window, looking into the garden, at the drooping thorns and out to the brown heath beyond. What were they looking at there? They were looking at the stork's nest on a tumble-down cottage. The roof was covered, as far as there was any roof to cover, with moss and house leek. But the stork's nest made the best covering. It was the only part to which anything was done, for the stork kept it in repair. This house was only fit to be looked at, not to be touched. I had to mind what I was about, said the wind. The cottage was allowed to stand for the sake of the stork's nest. In itself it was only a scarecrow on the heath, but the dean did not want to frighten away the stork, so the hovel was allowed to stand. The poor soul inside was allowed to live in it. She had the Egyptian bird to thank for that. Or was it repayment for having once pleaded for the nest of his wild black brother in Borobi Forest? Then, poor thing, she was a child, a delicate pale hyacinth in a noble flower garden. Poor Anna Dorothea, she remembered it all. Ah, human beings can sigh as well as the wind when it sows through the rushes and reeds. Oh dear, oh dear! No bells rang over the grave of Valdemar Da. No schoolboys sang when the former lord of Borby Castle was laid in his grave. Well, everything must have an end, even misery. Sister Ida became the wife of a peasant, and this was her father's sorest trial. His daughter's husband, a miserable serf, who might at any moment be ordered the punishment of the wooden horse by his lord. It is well that the sod covers him now. And you too, Ida. Ah, yes, ah, yes, poor me, poor me, I still linger on. In thy mercy release me, O Christ. This was the prayer of Anna Dorothea as she lay in the miserable hovel which was only left standing for the sake of the stork. I took charge of the boldest of the sisters, said the wind. She had clothes made to suit her manly disposition and took a place as a lad with a skipper. Her words were few, and looked stubborn, but she was willing enough at her work. But with all her will she could not climb the rigging, so I blew her overboard before anyone discovered that she was a woman, and I fancy that was not a bad deed of mine, said the wind. On such an Easter morning as that on which Valdemar Da thought he had found the red gold, I heard from beneath the stork's nest a psalm echoing through the miserable walls, it was Anna Dorothea's last song. There was no window, only a hole in the wall. The sun rose in splendor and poured in upon her. Her eyes were glazed and her heart broken. 
This would have been so this morning, whether the sun had shone upon her or not. The stork kept a roof over her head till her death. I sang at her grave, said the wind, and I sang at her father's grave. I know where it is, and hers too, which is more than any one else knows. The old order changeth, giving place to the new. The old high road now only leads to cultivated fields, while peaceful graves are covered by the busy traffic on the new road. Soon comes steam with its row of wagons behind it, rushing over the graves, forgotten, like the names upon them. Phew, phew, let us be gone. This is the story of Valdemar Da and his daughters. Tell it better yourselves if you can, said the wind, as it veered round. Then it was gone. End of section 43 Recorded by Evan Smith